welcome students to another one of your flipped lectures. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about World War I, also known as the Great War and the War to End All Wars. This war is going to last for four years from 1914 to 1918. And in this war, 70 million soldiers, the most soldiers who had ever fought in a war, are going to be a part of it. And out of those 70 million, about 9 million are going to be killed. This is also going to be a total war meaning that all of the people in all the countries involved will be involved in some way in the war. This means that even civilians are going to end up having to make sacrifices and they're going to be a part of the war effort. They're also going to be in the line of fire and a total of 15 million, including 6 million civilians, are going to be killed during this conflict. So when we look at why this war starts, this war doesn't really make a lot of sense to a lot of people. And it's really a European war. The United States gets involved, but it is not really linked with any of the causes of the war. The primary cause of this war is probably the alliance system that existed in Europe leading up to 1914. Other factors include the idea of nationalism and rivalries between these European countries, as well as a desire to bring honor and glory to both their country and also to themselves as citizens of it. And ultimately, each country at the outset of this war believes that it will be the country that is going to emerge victorious. Another cause of this is going to be the arms race between Germany and Great Britain. Both countries are going to basically start getting into an arms race, and when you have a lot of different countries all vying to be the biggest military power, you're going to be very willing to use these weapons that you have created. And ultimately, the spark that's going to ignite the powder keg of all these other causes is going to be that the region known as the Balkans and other places around Europe are going to be very unstable. A lot of people are going to want independence from these European empires ruled by monarchs prior to this time. And as a result of this, there is going to be a lot of small conflicts that are eventually going to lead to the breakout of World War I. So really quickly to break down the alliance system. The alliance system is basically the balance of power between countries in Europe. Each country wanted to basically be allied with a couple of other major powers in order to prevent any one country from either gaining too much power or from being willing to attack another. The idea was if, if one country was attacked, all the other countries would get involved in a war, and so the idea was that none of these countries would ever have to fight. But as we're going to see, this is really going to not work. And the two alliances that are going to exist are going to be the Triple Alliance between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, and the Triple Entente between Great Britain, France, and Russia. Now, these sides are going to change at the outbreak of World War I, but this is how it looked before. These alliances are going to change during the war, and the major powers are going to be broken up into two different groups. You're going to have the central powers, which are going to be Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Then you're going to have the allied powers, who are going to be France, Great Britain, and Russia. However, Ottoman Empire wasn't an originally an ally with Germany and Austria-Hungary, and Russia, once the Russian Revolution happens, is going to end up leaving the war. So let's talk for a minute about nationalism and rivalries. The guy in the picture is Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and he is a great example of the nationalism that was going on in Europe at the time. A lot of these major European powers were basically caught up in this feeling that their country was the strongest, the most superior, and as a result should be the most powerful empire not only in Europe, but likely in the entire world. As a result of this, major rivalries are going to develop between countries that are going to lead to these conflicts that are eventually going to cause the First World War. And, this, and the biggest of these two rivalries is going to be between Germany and Great Britain. And both of these countries are basically going to try to show their superiority in the time leading up to World War II. There's also a sense that wars are glorious, that basically to go and fight, to expand the power of one's country, was an honorable and great thing to do. And so, during this time, you're going to have a lot of people believe that war should happen so that their particular country could gain more power. There's also going to be a major arms race brought about by the Industrial Revolution and the, and the enhanced emphasis on in industry 
and the military in a lot of these major European powers. The biggest arms race is going to be between Great Britain and Germany, and it's going to be about naval power. Traditionally, Great Britain had always had the most powerful navy, but Germany, when they came on the scene, began creating a lot of modern-day battleships and also modern submarines. As a result of Germany's building of a large navy, Great Britain also had to keep pace, and so these two countries got into a competition that other countries would then jump in to see who could build and have the strongest military. Now, the problem with it is, is that when you have a very strong military, the people in your country are going to want to use it. And finally, there's going to be a lot of instability around the world. This nationalism that took place in the major European countries is also going to take place in a lot of other smaller countries, where a lot of the different countries that are ruled by the large European powers, such as Great Britain, Germany, France, Austria, Hungary, are going to start to want their independence and their freedom. And the man pictured, Gavrio Princip, is going to be a very important character, and he was a Bosnian nationalist who basically wanted Bosnia and Serbia and all these other small countries to have their independence from the Austria-Hungarian Empire. When we're looking at the map, the area that we call the Balkans is directly south of Austria, Hungary, and Russia. They're the countries of Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Albania. So when we talk about the Balkans, we're talking about these small countries that were all under the control of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. You also see that Russia is very close, and that's going to be important because Russia has always considered themselves the protector of some of the ethnic groups that are going to be living in those countries. But another thing that's going to cause this war is that actually most of the people at the time are going to be hoping for a war. Our ideas about war now were, are not the same ideas that people had back in 1914. The intelligentsia of Europe, the educated group of people, primarily college educated, who had a lot of cultural and political influence through things like books and newspapers and a lot of these people were politicians, believed that Europe had grown decadent. That basically it was in a state of moral and cultural decline. That the old way of doing things had kind of have kind of grown stale, and that Europe needed a new rebirth. And they believe that the only thing that would shake things up in Europe and cause that rebirth and kind of new ideas, new ways of thinking, and new ways of ruling in politics was a war. But none of these people thought that any sort of a war would last more than a couple of weeks or a couple months at most. Because prior to this time, a lot of the European wars had been small and there hadn't been a huge impact. So at this time, a lot of the intelligentsia are going to actually start calling for a major war. They think this will be a good thing. And the other reason that people are going to hope for a war is the sense of nationalism, that each country believes that it is the strongest in Europe and that it will easily win a war. And all the citizens of the major powers obviously want to expand the power and prestige of their individual country. So all of this is going to lead to a situation where when the excuse for war comes, there's not going to be many people who are going to resist it. So Europe is going to go to war on June 28th of 1914. And in this image, it shows the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand by, this, by the Bosnian nationalist Gavrilo Princip, a member of the Black Hand terrorist organization. This, this assassination of the Archduke took place in the country of Serbia in the capital Sarajevo. Now, Serbia was ruled by Austria-Hungary, and the Archduke was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. And so, the Serbian government actually wanted there to be a war. And so they allowed this terrorist organization and also its member, Gavrio Princip, to basically have an opportunity to assassinate the Archduke. The hope was that if they started a war, Austria-Hungary would be destroyed and Serbia and Bosnia would be able to get their independence from this empire. Princip assassinates the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The country of Austria-Hungary is furious. And they're going to blame the country of Serbia for allowing the assassination to happen. They're going to issue an ultimatum. If you remember from the first unit, an ultimatum is a list of demands. And Serbia is not going to basically agree to all of the demands of Austria-Hungary. 
So as a result, Austria-Hungary is going to declare war on Serbia. Once Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, all hell breaks loose in Europe. The country of Russia, which basically thought of itself as the protector of the ethnic groups in Serbia, known as the Slavs, decided that they would have to step in to prevent Austria-Hungary from basically punishing Serbia. So Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary. And because Russia declared war on Austria-Hungary, all the other alliances of Europe were called in. Germany, which was an ally of Austria-Hungary, declares war on Russia. Then France declares war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. And then Germany declares war on France. And the Ottoman Empire is going to, is going to ally itself with Germany and Austria-Hungary, and they too are going to enter the war. And then once Germany basically tries to invade France by going through the country of Belgium, Great Britain is going to declare war on Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and Austria-Hungary. So what you have is in a very short time, because of all these alliances, a very small incident between two countries turns into a major world war. A little foreshadowing for basically our discussion of World War II, this is a picture of Munich on the day that the war was declared. In the crowd is a very young Adolf Hitler who is basically preparing and very happy for this war. Adolf Hitler will be one of the people who is going to sign up to go fight for Germany in the war. But this war is going to start, and it's going to start with a couple of large movements, a couple of large assaults by Germany into France. But really what's going to happen is that neither side is going to gain an advantage. The weapons are too advanced, and so the idea of large amounts of men making attacks is quickly going to break down. So what ends up happening is that both sides are going to settle into a stalemate. The battle lines that are going to be set at the beginning of the war in France are going to end up being the battle lines for pretty much the entire war and neither side is really going to gain an advantage you're going to learn a lot more about this in your web quest but understand that this war leads to a situation called trench warfare and these are the battle lines that are going to be basically the same for the entirety of World War I both of the sides are going to basically have some conflicts at the beginning and then they are simply going to dig in they're going to dig trenches that are going to look like this. And if you want to see a picture of one, a photograph of one, this is what a trench looked like. It is literally a hole dug in the ground in a line that's going to extend all the way from the English Channel all the way down through France. And these battle lines are largely going to remain unchanged as neither side is going to be able to gain an advantage. However, even though neither side gains an advantage, there is going to be an incredibly large loss of life. The new weapons of the time, including the machine gun, airplanes and zeppelins, and poison gas, as well as high-powered rifles that can shoot accurately across the trenches, are going to mean that a large number of people are going to die for almost no gains on either side. And this is what the trench system looked like for a lot of these soldiers. You would have three different trenches. Maybe you'd be at the front line trench, and in between you and the other side's front line trench would be a stretch of land called no man's land. And no man's land was basically the space between the two lines that you had to try to cross if you wanted to attack your enemy. The problem with this no man's land is that it was full of barbed wire covered completely by machine guns and rifles and sometimes with poison gas. It was very very difficult to get across no man's land and every time the soldiers attacked a large number of them would die and their bodies would be left in no man's land. Another piece of technology that was invented not invented but improved upon during this time was artillery long-range artillery that could fire miles away accurately. This meant that while these soldiers were sitting in these trenches, they were almost constantly under some type of bombardment from artillery. This meant that even if you were sitting in your trench, you were still vulnerable to attack. These shells would go off and cause huge explosions and sometimes cause loss of life. The trauma of having to deal with being constantly bombarded for sometimes weeks at a time would cause a lot of these soldiers to develop post-traumatic stress disorder that during this war they're going to cause shell they're going to call it shell shock 
Here's another picture of people in the trenches. As you can see, a large number of people basically just living in these holes in the ground. Picture of soldiers moving through a trench to basically try to get out to no man's land. As you can see, there's already explosions happening and there's barbed wire everywhere. So the conditions in these trenches were pretty poor for most of the soldiers. Because there were holes in the ground, they were constantly wet. Because there was so many dead bodies and so, such high casualties, you would have awful smells. And also, these soldiers had to deal with parasites, lice, diseases, and other things that generally made life in these trenches almost unbearable. A large number of soldiers are actually not even going to die of combat, but they're going to die of diseases in these awful conditions in the trenches. And again, you're going to learn more about these conditions in your web quest, but I wanted to get across to you how awful this war really is going to be for the men fighting in it. This picture is of soldiers actually trying to pick lice out of their clothing. Lice and fleas. There were also terrible diseases, including one called trench foot. And trench foot happened when your feet remained too wet for too long. Here, an officer is checking his soldiers for signs of trench foot. Because if, you, if your foot is submerged underwater for too long, it will cause a disease that is going to start to rot the flesh off of your foot. Warning, the next part is graphic, so anybody who does not want to see this, close your eyes and wait until I tell you to open them. Here's a picture of what trench foot can do to a soldier. All of you are closing your eyes, you may now open them. The other thing that was introduced during this war is chemical warfare in, in the form of poison gas. Mustard gas and chlorine gas would be released and basically tried to send, they try to send this gas across the trenches. However, the first times that they did this, they literally just tried to to put the gas out in the trench and hope that the wind kept blowing towards the other trench. The effects of this poison gas were horrific, and as a result of this, chemical weapons are going to be pretty much considered taboo for almost the rest of history. Here's a picture of soldiers blinded by their exposure to ke this chemical warfare and this poison gas. This meant that you also had to have the invention of new technology such as the gas mask. The first gas masks were actually very primitive, and what you would do is there's actually just a piece of cloth, and you would relieve yourself upon it, because the urine would actually create a filter that would keep the poison gas out. But eventually, more sophisticated gas masks were invented and given to soldiers on the front. The most terrifying part of being a World War I soldier was the idea of going over the top. Going over the top meant that you climbed over your trench and basically ran out across no man's land. When you got out across no man's land, you were under constant fire from machine guns, artillery shells, you were confronted with barbed wire, hand grenades, and rifle fire from the other trench. If you did manage to make it to the other trench, you then likely had to fight hand to hand with your enemy as you tried to move them out of their frontline trench. This experience is going to be very traumatic, and every time soldiers go over the top, it's going to result in massive casualties. The insanity of having men in large numbers charge a, charge a group of machine guns is going to lead to a lot of these high casualties. And basically, the tactics of the day had not caught up with the new weapons that were available. This is also going to be the first war where civilians are going to be considered primary targets. Germany is going to create Zeppelin bombers, literally hot air balloon bombers, that are going to attack cities like London. For, for the first time, civilians, in, civilians back at home are going to be subject to things like bombing raids. This is going to make World War I a total war, and the scale of this war is going to mean that almost everybody is going to be involved in one way or another. Whether, or not it, whether it's working in a factory or simply having to deal with being a combatant, being targeted, everybody in these countries is going to be touched by this war. This is also going to foreshadow a lot of the heavy bombing of civilian targets during the Second World War. Which leads me to the fact that airplanes are going to be a new military technology used in World War I. The first military airplanes are going to be relatively primitive, but they are going to improve over time and become one of the prime one of the primary weapons of the Second World War. 
The most famous of all of the fighter pilots in World War I was Manfred von Richthofen, also known as the Red Baron. He was considered the greatest fighter pilot of the war, and he shot down the, mo the most airplanes of anybody in the war. He is going to brightly color his plane red, and all of the other planes in his division are going to also be colored, leading them to be called the Flying Circus. But now we have to talk about the United States getting into this war. As we established before, it is a European war. It is not an American war. And so how does the United States get involved? Prior to the First World War, in the 1910s, the United States pursued a policy of isolationism, which basically meant that the United States was going to keep to itself and not get involved in foreign affairs. And as a result, when World War I broke out, the United States declared its neutrality. But the country itself was split. A large number of German and Irish Americans, recent immigrants, wanted the U.S. to either stay out of the war or join the Central Powers. This is because Irish Americans hate the British, and German Americans wanted the United States to join the side of Germany. However, most American citizens are going to be in favor of joining up with Great Britain and France. This is because most of the businesses and banks of the country had invested heavily in Great Britain and France. They had loaned them money, sold them weapons, and therefore there is a lot of money that is going to be invested in Great Britain and France winning this war. As a result of this, Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, his cabinet is going to be pushing him to consider joining the Allies. But the war is in Europe, so why would the United States go to war? And there are really two things that are going to lead the United States into war. The first is going to be German's use of unrestricted submarine warfare, where Germany used their submarines to attack and sink any ship, whether or not it was a warship or a civilian ship, that was sailing near Great Britain. And it sunk these ships without warning, because traditionally, if you're going to sink a merchant ship, you give the ship warning so they can evacuate all of the persons so that no one will be killed. But the German submarines are going to sink a ship called the Lusitania. And the Lusitania is going to have 128 Americans on board. And these Americans are going to be a lot of prominent Americans as well. Members of wealthy families who are well-known household names. But when 128 Americans die, this is going to turn public opinion against Germany, and Americans are going to be more willing to get involved in this war. But it's going to be a further two years before the United States gets involved. And the United States is going to go into World War I in January of 1917, after the Zimmerman telegram is sent from Germany to the country of Mexico. And Germany is going to send a telegram, a message, to Mexico that is going to offer them an alliance should the United States enter World War I. Germany is basically going to ask Mexico to invade the United States, and in return, if the Central Powers, which would include Mexico if they joined, won the war, then Mexico would get back all of the territory that it lost to the United States in the Mexican-American War. But Mexico, having just gone through a revolution, is going to reject the offer. And when Great Britain's intelligence, their spies, intercept the telegram, they're going to tell the United States that Germany was actively plotting an invasion of the United States by Mexico. And as a result of that hostility, the United States is going to declare war on Germany. And so the president at the time, who is Woodrow Wilson, is going to go to the Congress and ask them to declare war on Germany. And the Congress is going to vote to do so. So when Woodrow Wilson goes to war, he is going to say that the war is, is to make the world safe for democracy. But there's a reason that he uses that reason. World War I is a European war. The United States will not gain any territory, any money, or any power from basically winning this war. And so Woodrow Wilson has to give the United States a reason, a cause, to fight this war beyond just the Zimmerman telegram. And so he is going to use the idea that this war is going to be the war to end all wars. That after this war, democracy is going to flourish, and the world is going to be made safe. Now let's take a look at some propaganda. 
because the United States has to also fight a war for public opinion to get people to support the war. Here is a great piece of propaganda that basically is appealing to women, saying, help America's sons win the war by buying government bonds. Government bonds are basically when you buy IOUs from the government so that they can pay for weapons now and pay you back later. Here is another piece of propaganda, and World War I is going to be the first use of Uncle Sam as a recruiting tactic. The idea of I want you and I need you, Uncle Sam is invented for World War I propaganda. Here is a picture depicting the Germans as brutes and calling on the United States to enlist. The idea is that this mad brute personified by this gorilla has captured Lady Liberty and is getting ready to take her away and in all likelihood rape and kill her. Here's another example of great propaganda. One more example. Think about what each of these pieces of propaganda is trying to tell you. During this time, also the United States encouraged people to plant and grow their own vegetables. These were called victory gardens. And victory gardens were basically meant to free up more resources to basically send to the soldiers overseas. The idea was that every vegetable that you bought in the United States was a vegetable that then could not be sent across the seas to the soldiers in the army. Here is another image. Think about who it is trying to appeal to. And also, they created songs, such as Over There. You can look this up on YouTube, and there are still recordings of this. Basically, songs were written to try to encourage people to enlist and go and fight this war in Europe. So now let's talk briefly about the 14 points in Woodrow Wilson. The United States needs a cause for this war. Kind of the problems that had led European countries to fight each other don't really apply to the United States. It's a European war. The United States has no stake in it. So, the so Woodrow Wilson introduced the goals, which were 14 goals, of the United States for the war. And this was all to serve the need that the United States needs to be fighting for some type of higher cause. Something more than just the Zimmerman telegram. And so these are going to be the 14 points. The United States says that after the war is over, this is what they want to have in the war. They want no more secret agreements and alliances between nations. They want the seas to be free. They want free trade between countries not regulated by powerful navies and military. They want a reduction in the weapons. They wanted a redistribution of all the colonies held by these, mar by these major European powers. They wanted to allow Russia to decide its own government. We want to restore the country of Belgium, restore to France territory taken from Germany, sorry, French territory taken from Germany, return to Germany, readjustment of Italy, and kind of a couple of other things. The idea of self-determination, the idea that new countries, that new countries based on ethnic groups that had previously been controlled by empires, becomes a really, really big deal of Wilson's 14 points. And the 14th point is the League of Nations. This idea is the modern-day United Nations, basically an organization of countries that is meant to deal with international issues to prevent major wars from happening. So the League of Nations is going to be an American idea, though the United States is not even going to enter the League of Nations. But there's also going to be massive upheaval in the year 1917. This is when the United States is going to come into the war, but it's also the year that Russia is going to leave it. And American troops are going to arrive in Europe in 1917. Two million fresh soldiers to basically shore up those thin allied lines that had been decimated by years of fighting this trench warfare. And as a result, these American troops are going to turn the tide of the war because they're going to lead major assaults at places like Cantigny and the Argonne Forest in France. But the American troops coming in are going to give the Allies a huge advantage because they're going to have numbers and they're also going to have troops who had not been worn out by all these years of war. But the Russian Revolution is also going to happen in 1917. This war had grown really unpopular in the country of Russia. 
because there were massive shortages. Riots started in the streets in March of 1917. There were shortages of food, of fuel, of wood for fires, and all the necessities for life. And so riots are going to begin. In response to these riots, the Tsar, the King of Russia, Nicholas II, is going to leave the throne. Once he leaves the throne, a group called the Bolsheviks, which are communists led by Vladimir Lenin, are going to lead a second revolution after the Tsar leaves the throne to try to take over the government. And they are going to succeed. And once they take over the government, they are going to have Tsar Nicholas and his entire family killed so that no one could put the royals back on the throne. Once Vladimir Lenin and the communists take over, Russia will agree to leave World War I so that it can focus on creating itself as a new communist country. Here is a depiction of the riots in the street over all of these food shortages and also of the Bolsheviks who are bearing the red flag. So this war is going to come to an end with the collapse of the central powers. And Germany is going to be doing pretty well in this war, but all their allies are going to fall apart. There's going to be a revolution in Austria-Hungary as well. Basically, this war becomes so unpopular that in Austria-Hungary, the people are going to overthrow the emperor, Franz Joseph. The Ottoman Empire is going to be defeated, and they are going to have to surrender as well. So, Germany is going to be left to face the Allies by themselves. Because Germany is left to face the Allies by themselves, many in Germany believe that the cause is hopeless. And so there's going to be another revolution in Germany that is basically going to make the Kaiser, the king of Germany, flee for his life. After the revolution in Germany, a new government, a republic, is going to be established, and their number one priority is going to be to end World War I. So once this new government takes over, they are quickly going to surrender to the Allies. And on November 11th, at 11 o'clock, on the, the, so the 11th day, the 11th hour, the 11th month, the war is going to end in 1918. We still celebrate Armistice Day. See if you can figure out which modern day holiday we still celebrate on November 11th. And the surrender is going to come in a railroad car where Germany is going to surrender its army to France, Britain, and the United States. Bear in mind this is a railroad car because Adolf Hitler, who was a soldier in World War I at this time, is going to find this railroad car during the Second World War. Here is a picture of the men who signed the treaty and the end of the war. So the Great War was over, but in reality, the conflicts in Europe were really only beginning. And in your next flip lecture, you're going to hear about how the aftermath of this war is going to have almost as many consequences as the war itself.